discharge from committee and that wasn't successful. I'm just wondering if the um, the caucus is interested at all in entertaining that a discussion on that issue of whether to put to the people a of, um, of vote on whether to put a, a constitutional amendment on the dividend. Sure. Strangely enough, uh, we are getting information from different districts that favor that, uh, but right now that is a purely a chairman's priority to, to, to bring that bill up or not. And um, we'll just kind of wait for it to go through the process. Not every bill makes it through. We'll certainly consider it. It's, it isn't as if we haven't discussed it among ourselves, but I think one of the uh, biggest roadblocks it has is the idea, if you're talking about the same bill I'm, I think you're talking about, is that it enshrines essentially a government check uh, in the con Constitution. And that is problematic from a number of standpoints, but for anyone that has studied history, that certainly wasn't the idea of the Founding Fathers, that we would uh, ever just make payments and that would be a constitutional right. Uh, Senator Kelly, if I can just... Sure. There's several of my bills I'd like to yank out of committee and get <laughs> <laughs> to the forefront um, in the majority. I mean, the reality of it is that's how the system works. Right. And, uh, you know, if he has to, if he can convince that committee that it's the right way to go and that it should move forward, then that's how things work. And there have been some minority bills heard, and we've had some minority bills from the House passed. Um, in, on our side. So, um, like I said, if I could yank a few of mine out of committee, I'd like to do that. But unfortunately, we have this process and, and we're observing it and honoring it. Steve? Uh, Steve Quinn, KTBA News. Um, you folks, sir, the legislature has an obligation at some point to repay the CBR. The state still owes the oil industry almost a billion dollars in tax credits. And last December, Moody's did put the state on notice that it, another downgrade awaits if you don't, if the legislature doesn't have a plan that's durable, meaning it can withstand another downturn. Um, how do you see that as putting together something that's durable, something that can withstand some sort of downturn? I'm not talking $10 oil, but. Um, uh, and have to pay, repay the CBR and pay the billion dollars True. in credits. Well, uh, we feel our plan is durable. Um, remember that, um, so we had a little meeting Friday and some of you asked about the downturn. The reality of it is that's what's robust about a POMV is that it deals with the downturn because it's a five-year trailing average. Um, we know that comments we heard about uh, a five and a quarter percent POMB stressing the the fund is caused because they double dip on the inflation proofing, not only the inflation proofing in the bill, but they add two and a quarter percent on that, which is a seven and a half percent return, which is higher than any of us are talking about. So we do feel like we have a robust plan. We've also talked about the willingness to discuss in the future if we have a significant downturn in oil price or production and uh, market returns that are challenged over time. We do need to have an additional um, program in place, but that's not what we're doing this year. This year, we're hoping to access through a POMV that is robust and that uh, fulfills all the principles of the fund. And um, we believe that by beating inflation that we're going to be dealing with a balanced budget, if not next year, the year after. Yeah. And all of the models demonstrate <clears> that, <throat> including the fact that the, the administration, now their tax is about new capital and not filling the gap. So we, we believe that there is a robust plan, plan in place. Steve, you know, the, you use the word POMV as we all do. We throw that word around because we're familiar with it in, in this room and in this Capitol building. Um, most, to most people, POMV doesn't have a, an automatic meeting. I, I always talk about a, a program that stabilizes the dividend and stabilizes the payout. And I think it addresses exactly, a POMV exactly addresses uh, market downturns and changes in the economy. The whole idea of a POMV is to stabilize the amount that you're pulling from the fund in an annuity, and it uh, eliminates some of the roller coasters uh, uh, of the ups and downs of the market and the ups and downs of our oil price and our and our funding. Um, so I, I guess 
we should probably start speaking of it in those terms, that it is a stabilizer and it will protect the dividend from a large market correction. A uh, quick follow-up for, <clears throat> for Senator Giesel. Um, uh, you've held, I believe, one hearing on the oil tax credit um, plan from the administration. Um, where do you see this bill going? So, Steve, what you're referring to is the, gov the governor's proposal to bond to pay off those tax credits that are owed. Um, Commissioner Fisher did a great presentation, uh, and it looks like it's, it's a pretty viable plan, uh, but there's still a lot of questions. And so uh, we'll be bringing the bill back up again, but how soon and whether we move it out of committee remains to be seen how many questions still exist. But I appreciate, absolutely appreciate, the governor focusing on that because it is affecting the credibility of the state of Alaska to have those hanging out there unpaid. I think it's pretty dangerous, too, to begin to rewrite the formula, and we, we're seeing that right now, that there is a, a move in this building to rewrite the, uh, uh, the credit formula. Um, we could find that it was very wrong uh, fairly quickly, and, and I think we should probably go with the formula that we have and try to apply some kind of answer to that, and the answer that the governor has come up with is this bonding bill, and uh, Senator Giesel and others will, will vet it. Thank you. Uh, for Senator Machicki, Shauna Crondall, Alaska Education Update. First, uh, Senate Bill 185, the hi re hiring of retired teachers. Um, it's having its second hearing in the Senate Education Committee on Wednesday. Is that, does that have very much Senate support, and is it going to get through Senate Finance before the operating budget hits Senate Finance, or do you think that'll maybe come toward the end of session, and how much support do you think it has? Well, from what I can tell right now, talking to people on both sides of the aisle in both bodies, I think it has support. Uh, I think there's a good chance that it gets um, across to the House before that. The House version doesn't seem to be moving um, as quickly. Um, maybe that whole minority majority thing, but um, I do believe that it has uh, a chance of getting across before the budget discussions get hot. Certainly is um, a tool that will alleviate some of the issues we're seeing on filling positions, it's not meant to replace any other teacher positions. It's just a, an available tool for putting the most experienced um, teachers back into the classroom temporarily when there's a, a gap in coverage. Becky again. <coughs> Becky Board with AP. I know we don't have the finance co-chairs up here, but um, Senator Michiki, do you, do you know what the plan is for when the um, the early funding for education bill might resurface? Is, is that you, are you guys looking at a timeline similar to when the Senate sends out its proposed operating budget? We'll be hearing the bill. We're looking at a more comprehensive solution. We certainly do not intend um, for education to be impacted like last year. I think the Senate is in favor of ensuring that if it does drag out, that we don't lose the talent in education that we did in uh, for FY18 at the beginning of the year there. That's a, that's a problem we all recognize. Um, so it has some support but we are looking at a more comprehensive budget solution um, that hopefully we're all, we have everything in the FY19 budget across the finish line in either the 90-day session or soon, soon afterward. I think you can probably rest assured, too, that if the Senate puts out an early funding bill for education, that it will actually have funding attached to it. James. Hi. James Brooks from the Juno Empire. Uh, this one's for Senator Giesel. I had a question about your Senate Bill 124, the uh, abor abortion surrender bill. Um, I would noticed that uh, it was Alaska Right to Life was opposing that bill, and I thought that was uh, something that I hadn't expected and uh, was curious to hear your thoughts on that and um, if you might make any changes to it in response. Well, thanks for the question, James. Um, yes, Alaska Right to Life vehemently opposes it, as does Planned Parenthood. So that's sort of an interesting scenario. I guess I've hit middle ground. Um, 
uh, my understanding, and, and you'd have to ask them, of course, uh, my understanding from Alaska Right to Life is they oppose the bill because it's not an absolute prohibition on abortion. And they're absolutely correct. It is not. Uh, it addresses uh, allowing the child the opportunity for life when they reach the age of viability, so the gestational age of viability, which these days is around 20 weeks. So that's at about five months gestational age uh, when they have fully functioning uh, systems, organ systems, they have fingerprints and footprints uh, and feel pain. That has been well documented as well. So the abortion procedure used at that stage of gestation is actually something called dismemberment. And I'm not gonna go into details of what, what that is. I think you can, as an adult, extract what that means. So that's what the bill's about. And um, uh, that's uh, my understanding of why Alaska Right to Life opposes it. Mm -hmm. But you're not planning any changes to meet their concerns? I am not planning any changes to the bill. Wrap up, anyone? Should we do this later? They're <laughs> rather Too uh, early. Even Mauer's quiet. <laughs> okay. Thanks for stopping by, guys. Let's call it. <laughs>